Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Why don't we just wave at one another in there? It's good to see you all in God's house on this afternoon. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we are here to rejoice in God's goodness, in God's grace, and just to celebrate the Lord Jesus and what he's done and what he's doing and what he will do in our lives. Amen? Amen. Just before the ministry of the word, allow me just to bring to the attention of the church uh, the announcements of those who are bereaved. Uh, we bring to the attention of the church uh, this bereavement of uh, the husband to our dear sister, Caroline Mukuna. Uh, her husband was involved in a tragic road accident. Um, I think this past Wednesday uh, along Thika Road. Carol is a member of our church. We do want to stand with this family and pray with them through this uh, difficult period. We also bring to the attention of the church the passing of uh, the mother, not the mother, the father, sorry, the father to Pastor George and uh, Kate Ndungu. Actually, this is Kate Ndungu's father. He had been uh, hospitalized for about a week, uh, but then we got information uh, yesterday morning that uh, he had uh, passed on. Um, when this happened yesterday, the family made arrangements, and whereas the body had been in hospital, in a Nairobi hospital, they were able to move the body back to where the father lived, that is across towards Nyeri, and so that happened yesterday. I spoke to Pastor Ndongo at about 11 p.m. yesterday, and they had arrived, and uh, they were at home, and they had shared the news with other significant members of the family. Now, of course, uh, we'll be bringing further announcements with regard to just uh, where we can stand and support this family through the meetings that may be held throughout the week, and also the funeral and the burial services. Uh, we may have to share that information via our social media platforms. So this is quite a difficult season for us as a church. Uh, we've been in this season for some time. We pray indeed that the Lord would stay the hand of suffering and pain and death in our midst. Uh, so let's keep at the place of prayer as we trust God to hold our hands. Amen. Amen. I'd like to just refocus our attention now to the ministry of the Word of God. Now our theme for this year, the theme statement is destined for the next level. Indeed, the theme statement is drawn from the book of Isaiah chapter 43 verse 19. The first part of that verse says in the NIV version, see, I will do a new thing. These are the words of none other than God himself, declaring that he will do a new thing. Other versions phrase it, behold, I will do something new. We continue today focusing on our theme, but our message today will be drawn from the book of Isaiah chapter 44 from verse 1 to 5. And as you open and get to that text, whether you have your physical Bible or whether you have it in digital format, just let's get to Isaiah 44, 1 to 5. Allow me to remind us that Isaiah wrote these prophecies. And when he was writing or prophesying, he was speaking futuristically. The first 39 chapters of Isaiah record prophecies of God's judgment upon the leaders and the people of Judah. Because they had broken the Mosaic law under which they were to be living at that time. And judgment was to come to them by way of them being conquered by their enemies at war. And these enemies were eventually to carry them into captivity in exile. In the second part of Isaiah's prophecy, that is from verse four, chapter 40 all the way to chapter 66, we see a twist different message that Isaiah speaks and he speaks a message of hope 
That hope was to come indeed after the judgment period, which the prophet Jeremiah tells us was to last 70 years. So after 70 years in exile, in captivity, that was in Babylon, God was going to restore his people back to their land, back to the place of their divine destiny. Now, whereas Isaiah's message had relevance for the people of the day and time in which he lived, the people who would eventually go into exile were also beneficiaries of those very prophecies. And as they considered Isaiah's prophecies while in exile, they would indeed immediately recognize Isaiah as a true prophet because the judgment that he had prophesied indeed had come to pass. They would recognize that while they were in exile. But beyond that, they would be keen to hear what else this man of God had to say about them while in exile and what their future would be. So perhaps they would have questions about themselves, questions about their children. And they would wonder perhaps whether their children would perish together with them in exile and whether they would ever make it back to the place of God's promise. And those questions are not very different from the questions you and I ask of ourselves today and of children. We wonder sometimes about the success of our children. Will they get married? Will they be successful? Will they do well? We ask ourselves also questions concerning our own futures. How will it be for me? Will I do well? And so Isaiah, as he looked ahead into the future, stirred by the Spirit of God, he perceived difficulty, he perceived disheartenment and disillusion among the exiles. The Lord, however, stirred a particular prophecy on his heart, a prophecy that they would read or they would consider while they were in exile. And that's a prophecy that we want to read together. Isaiah chapter 44, verse 1 to 5. Let's read it together. And I'll be reading from the New American Standard Bible. You can follow with me in the version that you have. Isaiah chapter 44, verse 1 says, But now listen, O Jacob, my servant, and Israel, whom I have chosen. Thus says the Lord who made you and formed you from the womb, who will help you. Do not fear, O Jacob, my servant, and you, Jeshurun, whom I have chosen. For I will pour out water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. And they will spring among the grass. They will spring up among the grass like poplars by streams of water. This one will say, I am the Lord's. And that one will call on the name of Jacob. And another will write on his hand, belonging to the Lord. And will name Israel's name with honor. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Father, we thank you for your word to us today. Indeed, Father, you never gather your children in vain. And Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus because you have a purpose for which we are here Indeed, you have a purpose for which those who have connected with us via the social media channels are connected and are engaging with us. And even, Father, those who are sitting across in our overflow at the epicenter, your purpose, Lord God, stretches even to them. I ask in the name of Jesus Christ that, Father, our hearts would be ready and open to receive your word and that your ears would be attentive, Lord God, that no word of yours to us would drop to the ground. But that, mighty Father, we would hear your word and receive it, Lord, even as good soil receives the seed. And that, Father, that word would settle in our hearts and germinate and grow. And, Father, produce fruit, even in keeping with your word. Lord, I submit myself to you. I ask, Lord God, that it would please you to use me as a vessel, Lord Jesus Christ. Father, to divide the word of truth amongst all your people, that, Father, there may be satisfaction in your house. I yield, Father, to the unction of the Holy Spirit. Indeed, mighty Father, may it please you, Lord God, to use me to minister to your people. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. The text that we read begins by God calling his people to attention, to listen. In my version of the Bible, it begins with these three words. But now listen. That's how it begins in my Bible, in my version. That word, but, the very first word there, but, I believe is indeed very significant. The word implies a contrast from a certain past or present circumstance to an imminent future that would be distinctly different from their past or their present circumstance and experience. This contrast, I believe, represents the difference between what was there now and what was to be their next level. And for you and I, it would represent what was, is our experience with God today or in the past and what we are looking forward to experience with and in God with regard to our next level in the days that are ahead. Now in a short while, we'll see what it was that was forthcoming for these people, the people that Isaiah wrote this text to. But instructive for you and I to note is that God was calling his people to attention. And as he did so, he referred to them using two names. He referred to them using two names. The first was Jacob, which God, we see, used three times in these five verses. We see him using or referring to them as Jacob in verse 1. We see him also using that name Jacob in verse 2, but also in verse 5. The other name God used to refer to his people, as he called them to attention, is at the end of verse 2. And that is the name Jeshurun. So those two names, Jacob and Jeshurun. Now why these two names? And why are they used together? Now Jacob, we know, was the name of one of their great patriarchs. Jacob was the son of Isaac. And Isaac, you know, was the son of Abraham. And so all these three, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, these were Israel's great patriarchs that they recognized. But Jacob is the one who had 12 sons, the one from whom they drew their identity. Remember, in Israel, there were 12 tribes, and those 12 tribes were named after the 12 sons of Jacob. And so which of them, indeed, they drew their identity from the 12 sons of Jacob? But notwithstanding this, Jacob, remember, had a brother. And Jacob's brother's name was Esau. Yes. Jacob and Esau were twins. Esau was the firstborn. And the scripture tells us that after Esau was born, that Jacob also came out. But he came out with his hand holding the heel of his brother Esau. Contrary to the culture of the Jews at that time, Whereas Esau, by virtue of him being the firstborn, was to receive the double blessing inheritance from his father Isaac, by some twist of fate, Jacob, the secondborn, is the one who ended up with that blessing, the blessing of the inheritance, the double inheritance from his father. Later on in the scripture, we read and interpret from the scripture that Jacob was, quote-unquote, God's blue-eyed boy. Malachi chapter 1 verse 2 and 3 tells us, I have loved Jacob, but I have ate, hated Esau. Those are the words of God himself. And it's repeated in the book of Romans chapter 9 verse 13. Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. So indeed Jacob was loved. Jacob was favored by God. Jacob received that double blessing and so I believe by referring to the children of Israel, indeed in this text we've just read, Isaiah chapter 44, 1 to 5, by referring to them as Jacob, he was reminding them of the favor that they had with him. It's like he was telling them, I love you. I'd like us to notice 
that God does not just call them Jacob. He puts the word O before the Jacob. Two times that happens in these five verses. So that when he puts the word O before Jacob, as he's calling them, he tells them, O Jacob. We see that written in verse, let me just get the verse, in verse 1. But now listen, O Jacob, my servant. And then towards the end of verse 2, halfway down it says, Do not fear, O Jacob, my servant. That's how the Lord refers to them. Now you and I, when we are speaking to one another, we normally put an O before a name to express a variety of feelings. For instance, sometimes we want to express surprise. And so I would say something like, oh, Winnie, you're here. That expresses surprise, isn't it? Another reason why we put O before a name is sometimes for sarcasm. So that you can look at somebody and you say, oh. Isn't it? We do that as we speak to one another. Sometimes it's disappointment. And something tragic has happened. And when we come across that, we express our, the disappointment by saying, oh no. Isn't it? But in this context, why does God put an O oh before the Jacob, before he calls them? I believe God puts an O oh as an expression of endearment. It's kind of a lament expressing out endearment. And I compare it or I analogize, analogize it to Matthew chapter 23 verse 37 where Jesus is in Jerusalem and he looks at that city, the city that he the city that his father loved and he looked at the people there, the people that he loved and I imagine he stretches out his hand and verse 37 he says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you are not willing. He says, oh, Jerusalem. It's an expression of endearment, an expression of love. So in Isaiah chapter 44, in these five verses, when God calls Jacob, I believe he's not expressing surprise. I believe he's expressing endearment as he calls him, Oh, Jerusalem, or rather, Oh, Jacob. Oh, Jacob, he says. By calling them Jacob, I think God was telling them in the midst of the hardship, the disheartenment, the disillusion, he was telling them, I love you. I love you. This, I believe, is emphasized by God referring to them by this other name, Jeshuran. This name, Jeshuran, only appears four times in the scripture. The first three times are found in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 32 and chapter 33, when Moses was narrating Israel's history in a poetic song as he blesses them and he bids farewell to them. Moses, by this time, was a mze. He was old. He had walked with the children of Israel for 40 years through the wilderness. And remember, there was now a large age gap between him and them. Because remember, all those who are of age above 20 had died in the wilderness. Moses was a mze. And so as he speaks to them, he speaks to them a song, indeed, narrating their history. And he uses this name like a loving father or a loving grandfather. And he refers to them as Jeshuran. Three times in that song, he calls them Jeshuran. So that previous to Isaiah chapter 44 verse 2, when we see this name Jeshuran used, previous to that, the only other time it was used was in the day and time of Moses. Thousands of years ago, God picks up this name and he uses it. The name itself, Jeshurun, 
meant upright one or righteous one. It was actually a pet name that reminded Israel of her calling. Israel was called to be a righteous nation, an upright nation. And this was the pet name that meant that. And the thing with pet names between people in a love relationship is this. And as I say this, I believe maybe may, ladies may connect a bit more with this, maybe. Those names are very personalized. But when you mention that name in calling the one that you love, it communicates very clearly. And the communication is very clear, I love you. You know, between my wife and I, we have a pet name that we call each other. And so sometimes in conversation, when she calls and refers to me as Ken, hey, I know things there have gone south. <laughs> things are not okay. And so I have to bear, pay attention and take notice what's happening. But there are times when she just mentions that pet name, I know that we are on a high. She doesn't need to say that she loves me. Neither do I need to tell her that I love her when I mention that name. Just by mentioning that name, it communicates. And I have pet names even for my children, my biological children, but some, even some spiritual children that I have as we get into our relationship, I have assigned some pet names to some of them. And when I use those names in the midst of turmoil, in the midst of crisis, uh, when they're crying and they're trying to explain the hardship and the difficulty that they're going through, and I reach out and I express that name, that pet name to them, it reaches deep into their heart and communicates, I love you. And it's like they just melt. And they sense that they are anchored in a love that reassures them that it's going to be all right. I believe that's what the Lord was doing when he writes or commands Isaiah to speak this message to the children of Israel. When he tells Isaiah, write this, and Isaiah writes with these words, calling them, O oh, Jacob, O oh, Jeshuran. They hear those words. And what it communicates to us, to them, in the midst of the trouble, in the midst of the turmoil, in the midst of everything, it communicates to them that God loves us. God loves us. I want to ask us this question. Are you anchored in God's love? Are you anchored in God's love? Does God have a pet name for you? When he's talking about you. You see, being in a love relationship with God is the basis upon which one is positioned for the next level. You see, this theme that the Lord stirred in our hearts, positioned or destined for the next level, you know, it really sounds good. I mean, who doesn't want to get to the next level? Whether it's in career, whether it's in life, in marriage, in school, who doesn't want to progress and move from one level to another? And so there's a sense in which everybody wants to connect and say next level, next level. But this, th this is the thing. In God, how you position yourself for the next level is to be in a love relationship with him. To be in a love relationship with him. That's how you position yourself for the next level. And this brings us to the second point, which is implied by the contrast that I talked about in verse 1. The contrast that we said is implied by that word, but, which contrasts between either their past or their present and their future. Remember, we noted that the prophet Isaiah, as he looked into the future, as the Lord stirred his heart, he perceived difficulty, he perceived disillusionment, and he perceived discouragement, disheartenment amongst the exiles. But beyond that, Isaiah also saw revival. And as Isaiah saw revival, he characterized the revival in words that were not only so vivid to the exile, but they were also most enchanting 
something that they deeply desired. Consider what verse 3 of Isaiah chapter 44 says as Isaiah characterizes this revival. Verse 3 tells us, For I will pour out water on the thirsty land and streams on the desert ground. I will pour my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. Water on thirsty land, he says, streams on dry ground. You see, the children of Israel, or let me call them Jacob's children, they had two primary occupations. One of them is that they were shepherds. The second is that they were farmers. And as such, they depended on the land for their farm animals as well as their crops. And so this was their mainstay. This was the source of their livelihood. Now the challenge was this. One of the mosaic laws that they had broken that eventually resulted in their being judged by God allowing their enemies, the Babylonians, to conquer them and carry them into captivity was the breaking of this law of the Sabbath. The law of the Sabbath had a number of requirements. One of the requirements was that they would remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy so that every week they were to remember that Sabbath and keep that Sabbath holy. But the second requirement of that law was this, that they were not to till their land on the seventh year, but allow the land to rest. They were not to till their land on the seventh year, but allow their land to rest. A third implication of the law of the Sabbath was this, that on the seven times seventh year, seven times seven is 49, that is on the 50th year, they were to declare a jubilee. And in declaring that jubilee, there was supposed to be freedom for those who were slaves. And those who were slaves were to be returned or restored back to their lands and reclaim ownership of those lands. The people and the leaders had broken this law. So that the slaves, even on the year of Jubilee, they remained in perpetual poverty and they remained in oppression. And this displeased the Lord. This indeed grieved the heart of God. Listen to what the writer to the Chronicles writes concerning the destruction of Jerusalem and the exile of the people to Babylon, which was a judgment for the breaking the law of Moses. This is what Chronicles, Second Chronicles chapter 36, verse 18 to 21 says. Therefore, he, that is God, brought up against them the king of the Chaldeans. The Chaldeans are the Babylonians, who slew their young men with the sword in the house of their sanctuary. And had no compassion on young men and all virgin, old man or infirm. He gave them all into his hands. All the articles of the house of God, great and small. And the treasures of the house of the Lord. And the treasures of the king and of his officers. He brought them all to Babylon. Then they burned the house of God and broke down the wall of Jerusalem. And burned all its 45 buildings with fire and destroyed all its valuable articles. Those who escaped from the sword, he carried away to Babylon. And they were servants to him and his sons until the rule of the kingdom of Persia. And listen to what verse 21 says. To fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, until the land had enjoyed its Sabbaths. All the days of desolation, it kept Sabbath until 70 years were completed. So the Lord sent them away into Babylon. Why? So that the land may enjoy its Sabbaths. I believe one of the benefits of the Sabbath year, where they were not to till the land, is that's the way in which God had made it for the land to be rejuvenated, for the land to regain, indeed, its fertility and vitality, that it may produce good crop for them. But for them, by ignoring every seventh year, and the next seventh year, and the next seventh year, what happened? 
the land indeed lost its fertility. And I wonder, I wonder about a certain prophet. Just before the exile, the prophet Habakkuk, he recorded a prophecy which you and I, when we read it today, we read it as an encouragement during hard times. But I want us to consider just for a moment, not the encouragement that the prophecy intended, but let's consider the gloomy picture that the prophecy spoke of. That's in Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 17. This is what this prophet writes. He writes, though the fig tree does not bud, and there is no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails, and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen, and no cattle in the stalls. And I know you know the next part, that's the part of encouragement. And Habakkuk continues writing, saying, Yet I will rejoice in the Lord, and I will be joyful in God my Savior. But I wonder, I wonder. You see, because when Isaiah was prophesying, Isaiah lived in the year about, he prophesied in the year about 750 to 700 BC. Habakkuk was, came much later. Habakkuk prophesied from the year about 640 BC to about 609 BC. That was just about four years to the Babylonian captivity. So Habakkuk was prophesying just on the eve of the captivity. And so when Habakkuk prophesies saying, when the fig tree does not bud, when there are no grapes on the vines, when the olive crop fails, when the fields produce no fruit, when there's no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, I wonder to myself, is Habakkuk the prophet speaking metaphorically? Or is he speaking in anticipation of the looming destruction? Or is it possible that this massive crop failure and the massive animal failure that he so graphically described is something that he had witnessed to some level because indeed the land had begun to lose its fertility. Could it be that right before the exile, they were living in terrible times? I believe those who went into exile, they knew exactly what crop failure was. They knew exactly what it was to have no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls. So that when Isaiah prophesies and declares to them of God pouring water on thirsty land and streams of on dry ground, because they were farmers and because they were shepherds, they connected with this image so vividly. They connected with it. They knew what it meant for water to be poured on dry ground. They knew what it meant for streams indeed even to flow on the dry ground. It was so vivid. Not only was it vivid, it was so enchanting, so desirous of them. It spoke of a revival of their livelihood. It spoke of a restimulation of their economy at individual level, at family level, and indeed the whole society. And the thing is this, it is not the government of Israel that was trying to kick a stimulus package into the economy to revive it for some time. No, it was God himself who was providing the resource that is needed in order for their livelihoods to be revived. The text continues and says, I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. God indeed was saying he's going to pour himself out on them. He's going to pour himself out on them. Why was God going to pour out his spirit on them? What would lead to such an outpouring? I believe we're told in verse 3. And verse 3 says this. For I will pour out water on a thirsty land. 
on a thirsty land. And this connects with the love relationship that we are to have with God. You see, when you're in a love relationship with somebody, you're thirsty for them. You're always thinking about them. You desire to be with them all the time. When they are not in your presence, you wonder what are they doing? Where could they be? When they are not with you, your mind is constantly engaged with them. Why? Because you love them. That's what love does. It goes beyond the mind. It goes somewhere deep into the heart. Sometimes we do some embarrassing things. Even for those people that we love, we go an extra mile. And I pray and I hope that even we who have been married for some time, 10 years, 20 years, and I know there are some 30 years plus, I pray and I hope that that love between still stirs. You see, I remember as I was dating this girl here, I did some embarrassing things. Why? Just because of love. Just because of love. Let me not mention because this thing is being recorded on social media. <laughs> when you love somebody, you and I know, we can go far. You give yourself. You give your money. You give your time. You give your everything. You think about them. Sometimes, you even go to the extent of wasting time. Daydreaming about them. Is that what characterizes your love relationship with God? You're always thinking about God. <clears throat> so what's God doing now? What is he thinking of now? If we do it with those people we see and love, how much more aren't we to do it with the one who died for us? Scripture tells us greater love has no man than this, that he would shed his life, give his life on the cross. Are you anchored in God's love? I believe that if we express our love to God like that, and you know, I'm not just talking about these external expressions of love, you know? There are some husbands that come and tell the wife, Sasa ni nini unataka? Nime kununulia nyumba, ndiyo hiyo. DSTV ni melipa. Internet iko hapo. Ni nini? Chakula iko kwa fridge. The wives, they appreciate those things. But they are able to discern that love that comes from the heart, from within, they can. That's the one that they want. And sometimes even without those things, if that one is there, it is enough. That's the love that God is looking for. So I want us to be careful of these external expressions of love. God does not see things as man sees. God looks at the heart. He looks deep within the heart. And I believe when God looks at the heart of one who is deeply in love with him, God's heart also just melts. And he melts and says, oh, my love, I will give myself to you. I'll pour myself fully in you. In other words, God's response to the one who loves him so fully and passionately to the one who is thirsty for him is to give himself fully, to pour himself out. That's why in this text, we see the text saying, I will pour out water on a thirsty land. Are you thirsty for God? Are you longing for God? Do you yearn for God? Do you think about God? 
Do you desire to spend time in the presence of God, in his word? Do you think about him? Do you meditate about God? Do you spend time praying? Are you willing just to serve God? Just how? When we're pursuing the one we love, we're willing to do anything, anytime, anywhere. Just so that we can attain that love. And we thirsty for God. And for the one who is thirsty for God and the one who God pours his spirit upon him. Our last point draws from that and this will not be long. I'm calling it the next level results. It's recorded in verse 4 and 5. This is what it says. And they will spring up among the grass like poplars by streams of water. This one will say, I am the Lord's. And that one will call on the name of Jacob. And another will write on his hand, belonging to the Lord, and will name Israel's name with honor. Again, the picture painted for us is a very vivid picture. Capturing the image of what is known as the poplar tree. The poplar tree is actually a family of trees planted by streams of water. And I did some just basic Google research on the poplar tree. Came up with three, not three, but some basic characteristics of this poplar tree. Number one, they are fast growing. They are fast growing. Number two, they grow tall. Up to 20, some even up to 60 feet, they grow tall. Number three, they have a deep rooting system so that they're Roots go deep into the ground, and that's related to something else about this poplar tree. They are hardy. They withstand extreme temperatures. And that's the reason, I think the reason is that because their roots go deep into the ground, they are able to tap deep into the water tables that are far below and into the minerals that are deep down so that it doesn't matter what's happening on top here. Sometimes you might find that the climate is harsh, either too cold or too hot, but it doesn't matter because the poplar tree taps source its resource from deep within so that in harsh times, in the sun, in the rain, come wind, come high weather, it is ever standing strong. Amen. It is ever green. It is ever yielding its fruit. It's ever providing shade. It stands tall. Why? Indeed, because it is deep. God says that for the one he pours his spirit on, he compares them with this poplar tree. Fast growing. Have you ever worked in an organization where you've worked there for some good period of time? Then this upstart joins the organization. And after a few months, he joined two ranks below you. After a few months, he's at your rank. And it rattles you a bit. But then after a little more time, he's your supervisor. Then after a few more, you know, sounds like a fast growing tree and the text says a fast growing tree among the grass so that the comparison between the one who pours who, who, upon whom God has poured his spirit is like a tall tree and the grass that is around it the one who experiences the outpouring of the spirit he stands tall amongst others in faith, the man stands tall, or the woman for that purpose. In family, the person stands tall. In career, the person stands tall. In school, the person stands tall. In every area of life, the person stands tall. And the person just seems to be on the fast lane of life. Why? God's spirit is upon them. You know, I recall, as a young boy, our dad would often drive us up country during the holidays. And as he drove us, there were always these cars that would pass us. And you know, as a young boy, because we loved cars and fast cars, we didn't want to be passed. 
And I'd always try to tell my dad, come on, catch up with that car, overtake, overtake that car. And there are some that would overtake. But there are other cars that after they pass you, they go and they go forever. <laughs> Effortlessly. Some of you will remember Wepesi. You remember Wepesi? That used to go to Western Kenya? There's some here who are too young for that. Ask your dad. You know? They would just pass you effortlessly and they would go and go and go and they would disappear. And that would happen because what powers them from within. They've got a particular engine, a powerful engine that from within gives them all that is needed, the wherewithal to get onto the fast lane and keep moving and keep moving. So that even if you're coming back from up country and you get to that hill of Kinungi, while you're stepping on the accelerator and your engine is going, him, he just turns onto the climbing lane and he, shoop, and he goes. Between these two cars, which one are you? But more so, which one would you desire to be? And this is what the scripture tells us. That for us to get to that next level, what it is based on is a thirst for God and a love relationship we have with God. And so I ask us again, are you anchored in God's love? Are you anchored in God's love? And by so being, are you indeed positioned for that next level? Because when you're anchored in God's love and you're expressing your love to God, through the thirst that you have for God, God sees that thirst and he pours his spirit into you. And the impact of the spirit, the results, next level results. Let us bow for prayer. Father, we thank you for your word to us today. We thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, that Father, you reveal truth in your word and you desire good things, Father, for us. I thank you, Jehovah God, that indeed you love us and you love us deeply and dearly. And for that purpose, Lord God, you speak to us and tell us that we need not fear for you have chosen us, you formed us. And indeed, we are yours. But I pray in the name of Jesus for all who are here that we would be not just positioned and anchored in your love, but that we would be thirsty, Lord, for you. For Father, the one on whom you pour out water is the one who is thirsty. The one on whom you fill with your spirit is the one who deeply desires and thirsts for you, Lord God. Oh, Lord. And the blessings would flow, Lord God, in our lives. Our time is fast spent, but allow me to ask you who are here, you who are across in the overflow, at the epicenter, and even if you're watching us on social media, are you in a love relationship with God? Are you in a love relationship with God? God calls you to that love relationship. When you can enter that relationship by accepting Christ into your heart, believing that he died on the cross to pay for your sins, and opening in your heart, allowing him to live as savior of your life, And if you want to make that decision right now, I want to urge that you just raise your hand just now. Whether you're right here in this tabernacle 
whether you're across in the epicenter or even across watching us virtually on our social media platforms, it doesn't matter where you are. This is between you and God. It's between you and God. Just put up your hand up high because you don't raise your hand to me. You raise your hand to God and tell God, God, here I am. Here I am, God. I've spent time trying to get to the next level through every and any other means. But I recognize now that it's not about those other things. It's about me being in a relationship with you. Me accepting you as Savior of my life. So for those of you who want to accept Christ into your life, or maybe you had been in a relationship with Christ, but then things happened and you, you walked away. Christ calls you back. He tells you, come back, my child. Come back. Just raise your hand up high. Raise your hand up high and say, I want to rededicate my life. And I will see it and we will pray. And for those of you who are raising your hands, just say this prayer after me. Say it as a prayer to God believing in your heart for he hears your prayer say Lord Jesus Christ I come to you today I thank you for the love that you have towards me I'm sorry that I have not responded to your love but today I ask you to forgive me of my sin to cleanse me of all unrighteousness. I respond to your love today by opening my heart and allowing you into my life as Lord and Savior. Help me to live for you from this day forward. Thank you for accepting me Thank you for hearing my prayer. Today I enter into a love relationship with you. And I'm grateful in Jesus' name. For those of you who said that prayer, whether you're right here in this auditorium or whether you're across at the epicenter, at the end of this service, I request just come across right here in the direction that I'm pointing at the front of the tabernacle towards my right, that's your left. We'll have a team of people waiting. We'll be there to guide you. If you said that prayer and you're streaming live on our social media channels, send us a message. Inbox us, let us know. <coughs> and we will be able to come to you and guide you on what you need to do next. But Father, for all of us, Lord God, who already know you, I pray that, Father, we will indeed thirst for you. And that as we thirst for you, Lord God, indeed, mighty Father, you will respond to this love and pour out your Spirit upon us. And as you do so, Lord God, may your blessings overflow in our lives. Thank you, mighty Father. Thank you, precious Savior. Thank you, holy God. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for who you are, for all that you've done, all that you're doing, and all that you will do. We thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you that you desire good things for all your people, Lord God. And that, Father, your desire for us, Lord God, is next level. Blessed be your name. We honor you and we bless you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I want to invite us this coming Wednesday. We'll be taking time just to pray through this text. To continue this conversation that we've commenced with God. Concerning this next level. Concerning our relationship with God. And thirsting for God. And I want to encourage us 
make a point, make it count, particularly through this season of prayer and fasting. Take advantage of the times of corporate prayer. Remember the scripture talks about the blessing being in the gathering of his people. So let's gather together for prayer. We'll be here on Wednesday from 6 o'clock onwards. You can come as early as 5.30. We'll also be here on Friday morning from 5.30 all the way to 7. Let's gather into the house of the Lord for a time of prayer. And those of you who know you don't may come for a prayer service Sunday morning when I know you're free, 8 to 8.45, that's our time of prayer. You can make a decision to be coming for the first service, but come at 8 o'clock and connect and engage in a time of prayer. May God bless you. May God favor you. Indeed, may God speak to you his language of love, calling you by a pet name that he has for you. And in so doing, may he reassure you. And as you thirst for God, may God pour his spirit on you and all the blessings that follow suit. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. See you this coming Wednesday as we gather together for prayer. Amen.